Yes, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone should stand by my side here. It's uh, Wednesday night. I hope you are all happy and healthy doing the things you love with those that you love doing them with. Guys, got a little transfer news, views and clues update for you. I've just finished doing the Devil's Advocate with... Uh, with Johnny, Dave was sick. And if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to. It was a really good show, two and a half hours worth of content. But I know that sounds a lot to digest, but it has been chaptered. So essentially the first hour of the show was more around what's going on with FFP and PSR, the inability for the Premier League to, uh, to get together. And despite all of their money, despite all of the expensive lawyers and people that can write down amendments in a clear and concise way, unfortunately, they have once again failed to hold up their end of the bargain, which is to uh, to be able to write down and ha leave no wiggle room around what the difference is between sellable assets that are on an infrastructure-based level. Consequently, even teams who wanted to vote in favour of the amendment had to reject it because they were left unclear as to what these things would look like in the future. What can you, what can you consider an infrastructure uh, item? What can you not? What is sellable? What isn't? And because the lawmakers did a terrible job of writing this stuff down, then the movement, the, uh, the motion was rejected and Chelsea get away with it again. Chelsea will now be able to carry on spending because they've managed to essentially get their hotels transferred onto their... Uh, their books as a paper profit, even though it doesn't really exist. Exactly the same thing will happen with their training ground. And in a nutshell, it leaves me feeling and reeling with the ineptitude of the Premier League. I actually don't even blame Chelsea. I think that they are just people who have significant ambition. They have very deep pockets and they have a series of loopholes figured out because they've identified that the Premier League rules are ridiculously naive, ridiculously weak, and don't hold any water if you were to be challenged in a court of law via them. And so every single time Chelsea act in a way where they overspend utilising one of these loopholes, the Premier League have to pivot and shut down that door, but another one's opened. First of all, it was the eight-year amortisation periods. Then it was these transfer of assets between hotels or the training ground to sister companies where it's a paper profit rather than a real profit to add to your revenue number, which allows you to sell. Then, of course, last summer, it was moving over, go, flying over to Saudi Arabia to speak to the guys from the PIF fund who don't own Chelsea, but are the biggest investor in Chelsea's biggest investor, Clear Lake Capital. And so what is good for the goose is good for the gander in that regard. Anyway, without boring you, I believe that there will be two or three further loopholes that are yet to be identified, that have yet to been uncovered by uh, Chelsea's behaviour or someone else's behaviour. And the show will carry on. The circus that it is will roll into town and will carry on making a mockery of all of the efforts that every other Premier League club who don't have access to the sums of money, the support, the financial and legal and intellectual property support that only one or two clubs actually have. And we spent the first hour of the show on The Devil's Advocate talking about that in detail. We also spoke about why it is that now, why now is Daniel Levy looking for investment into Tottenham? He has alternatives. If he doesn't want to give up control, he could go and get more debt, but it would come at a higher interest rate than the previous uh, set levels because that's where the economy is. So does he not believe in his projects that, or whatever his intentions are to spend the money on enough to find a more than 8% return on investment in a yield? Is that the rationale? Or is he looking for a buyout? Is he looking for the first stage of the actual a kind of rubber stamping of his profit? Because remember, whilst he gets paid a significant salary, he doesn't take dividends and his valuation is baked into the value of the overall company, but that doesn't become realised until you actually sell some of it. And so we're trying to figure out why now, not last year, not the year before, not 10 years ago, why now? Is it because he sees the competitive writing on the wall, that there's no longer just two or three teams that you have to overcome to win trophies that are better than you? 
that increasingly it's five. And if the Premier League continue with their ineptitude, it will probably end up being six or seven. Newcastle surely will be able to utilise the same loopholes that Chelsea have identified or have yet to take advantage of that I'm sure probably exist. What about the guys that want to invest? If Daniel Levy wants to sell right now, why? Outside of the idea of Joe Lewis just saying no more money, is it time for them to go? Are they, are, they, are they wanting out? Or more importantly, is it because it's financially more prudent to hand over some of the percentage of the ownership to somebody with a bigger plan, more ambitions, deeper pockets, more connections, and that they themselves think that there's loopholes within the system that they want to participate in. You know, maybe Daniel Levy should be praised for all of his preparedness for a future life as a football owner that had to deal with FFP and PSR. But maybe he was naive to believe that it actually held water and that in reality, he is sticking to the rules, but the rules themselves are more guidelines and the people above them are better and smarter and more wily than the people who wrote the rules. And ultimately what you get is a net-net scenario where the people with the deepest pockets wins and the people that are prepared to bend the rules to the point where it doesn't even look like a principle anymore will always be the people that take up the majority of the success in the Premier League. You can go and find all that stuff on the Devil's Advocate show if you haven't seen it already, guys. We go into a bit of detail. The second hour, we start talking more about the transfer news, views and clues. And on that, we've just got a couple of things that have come out subsequently um, this evening after the show that I want to just quickly run through with you. First and foremost, Tang Yun Dombele it is a fish official right now. He has left during the show. It was made official. He has left the club. And we don't know. It's an undisclosed settlement on his final packet. Remember, he would be owed £200,000 a week for the final year, which is about £10.4 million. Suggestions from the various sources are that we've shook hands and said £7.5 million. So we've saved ourselves £2.5 million or nearly £3 million by letting him go early. He can now go and get another job somewhere else if he wants to, or he can... I don't know, go and open up a McDonald's chain somewhere. But the end on Bele era is over. I'm surprised that we paid 75% of his salary. That's quite a lot. And you know what? It's a really sour, bitter end to a rubbish six years because it's not just that story, by the way. The end on Bele transfer window, when, when it happened, that particular window, most people were like, this is a brilliant window. And it turned out to be one of one of the worst in recent history and something that we've been licking our wounds from ever since. Next Guys, I'm so sorry. I got home, completely forgot about one of the topics, the main topic, in fact, the, the general reason why I went outside to even do this video anyway in my haste. So I'm going to slide it in now and then you'll get back somewhere on the video and then you'll get back to uh, wherever we were on the walk. But um, the main reason I, I want, the, the main topic, I guess, was that Hyung Min's son... Captain Sonny, whilst uh, on uh, international duty, was asked a question about his future, the transfer speculation about him leaving the club this summer. And his response was essentially, he hasn't heard anything from the club about that. It makes him feel very uncomfortable even talking about it. And that he's fully focused on Tottenham. And he is very happy in the Premier League. He's got a lot, to, uh, a lot more to achieve at the Premier League level and that's all he's thinking about uh, which I found really interesting because apart from people like myself and other people on Twitter uh, who have you know posited the question around is there a good time when's the right time to cash in on Sonny you know he's 32 his best assets are things that are going to recede over time 
probably doesn't suit this system in a nine back to goal as much. If there was to be a monster bid coming in from somewhere like Saudi Arabia to the tune of 80 million quid, and it was enough that it you know, financially made sense to the football club to sacrifice what you would be losing in the kind of Korean market and the sales and everything, then would it make sense to liquidate? Similar to like a Richarlison, but for different reasons, to liquidate one of these guys to be able to add some significant funds to your budget and then to be able to, to go and go through the proper rebuild with all the money that we need and, you know, go and replace some of these players with some, some younger guys that are going to be here for the next five or six years. I haven't seen any, and maybe I'm wrong here, and tell me in the comments if I am, but I haven't seen a single like serious journalist with any kind of level of like normal integrity or whatever actually link Sonny away from the football club or, or make any suggestion that he is um, looking to leave or the club are looking to sell. So it's a very odd thing for him to have, a question to have to answer because... I've not seen it being asked anywhere, but for what it's worth, he's obviously, it's brilliant that he says, um, you know, money doesn't drive him. He has to be careful coming from a guy who, who said those sorts of things in his, in his younger years to his bosses uh, that can be taken advantage of. So Sonny, learn your lesson, bro. Don't, don't ever say that. They'll pay you as little as they can. <laughs> but, uh, but it's interesting, you know, that he, he said he feels uncomfortable about the whole situation I don't know if it was news to him. I don't know if I'm missing something. But to me, on the one hand, delighted that he shows as much commitment as he does and, and that he's, he's, he's fully Tottenham, fully Coys. Uh, and it just it reminds me, I guess, of a topic that we were speaking about, you know, a couple of, uh, about a month ago on the channel, whether or not there is some validity to the idea of selling one of him or Richarlison or potentially both and then rebuilding the entire front line with some significant funds. I don't expect it to happen. Richarlison's already come out and said he's not leaving... Uh, England at least. He doesn't want to go to the Saudi Arabian League. I'm sure Sonny doesn't want to go to Saudi either. I don't know where else he would go that would pay the sort of money that would justify the cost from, and because of the opportunity cost of giving up the, the Korean revenue streams. Um, but you know what? I'll, I'll also go even further and say today's exercises, the video I did with Johnny going through that, what I've been speaking about on the channel the last couple of days, looking at all of the links to the various strikers that are out there that are, are apparently available, and then kind of putting lines through a lot of them one by one for one reason or another that they're either staying at the club they're going to, they've either agreed to go somewhere else, they're either too far too expensive, or there's too much unknowns and risk around where they're coming from, or whether they're going to be consistent enough, whether they fit the system. And then you know, I always say that that the wingers, great wingers, are ten a penny. The difference between the good and the great is the ones that have the final delivery. Well, again, in today's exercise, I was looking through the long list, the long list of of wingers that we've been linked with, and my takeaway at the moment is that I feel like the market, the transfer market speculation, at least, is a little bit dry and underwhelming. And so, previously to now, I've suggested that I would be okay with the concept of of selling Sunny. Um, if it meant everyone was happy and there was lots of money and we could go again and, and replace and get younger but better and all that stuff. But as I say, for how I feel right now, having looked at all of the various stories that are out there and the feasibility and the viability of a lot of them, I've got to be honest, I'm probably going to have to kind of flip-flop on that one and say I'd rather keep Sonny, love the fact that he's been so loyal, lo love seeing how he what he's been doing on his international duty and a fully fit uh fully on board fully um 100 committed sunny on the left or in the middle in certain scenarios is still one of the, the best and most dangerous players in the game and so the idea of selling your best striker last summer and selling your second best forward of all time potentially or one of them uh, the following summer just in the effort to raise funds when Tottenham have a traditional historical uh, track record of wasting the money that they raise anyway, probably was a silly idea on my part. And so I thought I'd mention it. Sonny was asked. If you've seen links, then let me know. But I, I haven't, so I don't know why he was asked anyway. But he said no, and he's happy. And now I'll let you get back to the rest of the video. Story: Emerson, uh, the, the deal is incredibly close. Apparently he's, I know I said this yesterday, but 20 million has been essentially agreed now from what I'm reading. Emerson Royale has agreed terms. 
despite the fact that AC Milan had a last minute change of plan and contacted Aston Villa to see if Matty Cash was available. He, they were told he was too expensive at £30 million plus, And so they said, no, thank you. And Emerson Royale looks like it is done. Will Lankshire, superstar from the under-21 team, player of the year, player of the season in the Premier League 2, uh, golden boot hero. There was a lot of panic this morning when we heard that apparently Middlesbrough were talking to him to try to poach him. And of course, I'm not familiar quite, I, I was supposed to ask Johnny today, I forgot to, um, how the contract thing works when you move from schoolboys to, to kind of a youth team to professional contracts. I think that you only get like, you can only sign them on one year extensions until they turn 19, I believe. I'm not sure the situation with Will Lankshire, but anyway, it, it led me to think, oh no, we're gonna get poached just as this guy is starting to emerge. But allegedly, that's not the case. It's just Middlesbrough are one of a long, long line of some Premier League, but definitely a lot of championship teams who want to take him on loan next season. And so that's the most likely outcome. So actually, it's not bad news, it's good news. He's, he's desired by some of the better teams in the championship. And hopefully, he'll get some minutes, some goals, and come back ready, and that would be fantastic. That would be sensational to see uh, Will Lankshire develop into, I don't know, what might be the next Harry Kane. Who knows? Dare I put that pressure on him? But you know what? He's a big, strapping, strong lad, and I think he'll be able to handle the championship if that's where he goes. Vanderson, story I've been talking about to you for the last couple of days. That story is still on, allegedly. However, Manchester United have entered the phrase. A lot of the players that we're linked with at the moment, we seem to be fighting with the same teams. Aston Villa, Manchester United and Arsenal. Uh, all teams in the Premier League. Bayern Munich maybe for Chris Furick. But the same names with Eze. He's, we're, we're fighting with those guys for him. Um, and Vanderson's the same. So at least we know we're all kind of fishing in a similar pool. And we'll see who has the financial muscle, who has the ability to move first. You'd hope that would be Tottenham on both counts. Who has the bigger brand and the bigger pull? Well, that might be a different situation. But Vanderson is wanted by both Manchester United and Tottenham. But you know what's really interesting, guys, is that according to Dead Telegraph, the Dutch, the Daily Telegraph, I guess, um, which is a, a decent outlet. It's not like a, a, a rag top, it's the Telegraph, essentially. But in Holland, they're saying that Tottenham are very much interested and pushing for Gare Struida. And if you did watch the show with Johnny, then you'll know that we spend a lot of time talking about Gare Struida. Johnny's a massive fan of him. I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, we've both spoken about him for over a year. His versatility is excellent. His drive, his passion, his pace, his ability on the ball. He... He understands how to be a centre-back because he's played 20% of his minutes at a centre-back, so he's good in the air. He knows positional play, back post work. He, he knows how to, 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 to um, handle people that are dribbling at him from, from, from the wide. He's also played at right-back, so you know he can get forward in the system that he plays in, in Feyenoord. He also can play as a, as a DM. Now, I'm not making the argument that we should get a versatile player to be our six. I don't, I think we need a six, but the, the strength of versatility essentially describes the strength of a player and his ability to do and to tick most boxes. If he can play a six, a wing back, a full back and a center back, then rest assured he's going to be good in the air. He's going to be good at tackling. He's going to be able to have a good footballing IQ. He's going to have a great vision for a pass. He'll be calm under pressure and he should be brave and tenacious and also have an engine on him because fullbacks need engines just like Bugsy needs bones. Uh, so that's the story, it's interesting. Now I said to you the other day, do I prefer Vanderson or uh, Archie Gray? Well, depends on the price. And Archie Gray at 50 million is too rich for my blood. I don't think we have enough money to be able to make that work and do everything else we need. Vanderson at 30, I thought was too expensive, but Vanderson at 25, 22, that sounds interesting. But Gareth Druida is somewhere between 25 and 28. And I actually think I'd rather pay a little bit more for Gareth Druida than I would Vanderson. And the Telegraph are saying that, that uh, Gareth Druida is very much up for it. And also, 
but Feyenoord are very much willing to cash in. So there's willingness. According, if the report's true, there's willingness on all sides the seller, the player, the agent, to get, in, to get on board and to come to the Premier League. And whether or not other teams are going to be interested in Gerstruida as well, it probably wouldn't surprise you if I was to tell you that Manchester United are looking at him, as are Chelsea, as are Liverpool. And so, again, you know, it comes down to not just money, it comes down to uh, the, the sales pitch, it comes down to how much opportunity they're going to get, and it comes down to a few other kind of internal monologue things that only Gerstruida is going to be able to tell you. But we'll figure it out. But either way, it's an interesting link, great player. And if it works out, it's fantastic. Tammy Abrahams, I talked to you about him yesterday. That story's grown some legs today. Listen, as much as I do like Tammy Abrahams, I don't fancy the player coming to Tottenham. As I said, I think that if you're going to move for a nine, it has to be someone who moves the needle. And I just... Tammy Abrahams is a good player when he's fit, but he spent most of last year out with a horrible injury. It's too much risk. Eight games last year, one goal, not for me. £30 million is the asking price. Sorry, even at that level, I just don't see it. Until he's proven that he's back to his best, not for me, so I'm, I'm off it. Ivan Tony, well, apparently, according to Ben Jacobs, Tottenham have got a free run at this guy if we want him. Arsenal are no longer officially interested. Chelsea are moving in a different direction. And so he wants to stay in London. If Tottenham put their money up and go for it, then he's the guy. And £40 million, I know a lot of you disagree, but I don't mind it at all. Santiago Jimenez, we haven't heard much out of this one for a while. I still like him, still a big fan of Jimenez, but there is risk, there's massive risk. We don't know about the transition from the Dutch League to the Premier League. We don't really know why it is that his season tailed off as bad as it did. But as a player, I think he's a really, really strong candidate. I've said to you from, for a year now that when I first watched him and nothing's changed, when I see him come deep and drive with the ball, he reminds me of Harry Kane. He's always looking up. He has the ability to pop the ball long, loopy kind of through balls with the outside of his peg or the outside of his foot. It reminds me very much of the kane Sunny partnership. And I think you might be able to recreate something between those two in the future. So I'm a big fan of Jimenez, but it comes with risk. It also comes with a very similar to Tony. And on the balance, I'd probably say on that basis, if we're looking for a here and now, because Tony's 29. And I know that Levy will probably say I'd rather Jimenez because there's sell on value. I don't know. Either or, and I'm, I'm okay. The vast majority, you can just put a line through them. It's only the, the ones that stand out to me that are, that are feasible, plausible, financially affordable, and that we hear about is Ivan Tony and Jimenez. The rest of them, I either don't want, they're too expensive, they won't come to us, they're going somewhere else, or for whatever reason, there's no links. That's it for today. I love you. Like, subscribe and comment. Get over to the, uh, the, the, the Devil's Advocate show with Johnny. Let me know your thoughts on the FFP thing and also let me know your thoughts on the Daniel Levy thing. That starts from about five, 10 minutes in until about an hour. The second half, so about 30 minutes until the hour mark, I think is about Daniel Levy and selling the club. And why now? Why the investment now? What's going on? Why would MSP want to get in just as he wants to get out? There's a difference in timing. Is there going to be a power shuffle, or power split? What's going on there? But the first half of the first half an hour is more around just how incompetent FFP rule makers are and the enforcers are and really what that means for Tottenham and all the other teams that abide by the rules and that have been pushing towards a system that was supposed to reward that kind of behaviour, but thus far hasn't seemed to have any teeth unless it's against the small teams who, you know, can hardly be blamed for, for falling foul by a couple of million because, you know, to those guys, a million here and a million there is meaningful and it can be influenced by just a couple of bad attendances that are lower than expected. So, uh, yeah. I got massive concerns about FFP and I don't this isn't like props to Daniel Levy for preparing everybody at Tottenham and the club for a system that was supposed to be focused on this but massive criticisms and concerns around the people that write the laws and that actually enforce them like subscribe and comment guys and as always bye bye okay.